but it will be in a second. Okay, I achieved success. Hooray! Hello, I am Billy, and this is Show and Tell. And as you can see, I have a bunch of wonderful knitters from around the world with me today who are all working on the same sweater, the Scaparelli Bonut sweater. And I don't have a picture of it, but I think the people watching are probably familiar because the thumbnail showed one of them. Now, some people dropped in while I was busy doing my magic. So let me welcome the last couple of people, Joan, Barbara, hi. And to the rest of you, welcome back. Um, I don't have anything really specific planned for today because everybody's at such a different place. So I'm gonna call on you one at a time and just give us an update of where you're at and don't tell us what your issues are. Just tell us like, you know, I finished the final, I'm working on the first sleep, blah, blah, blah. And then I'm gonna come back through and then we're gonna discuss one by one if people are having issues so that maybe we can try and help one another. So Eleanor, let's get started with you. You're on mute though, you have to come off. Okay, sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. That's okay. um, I'm getting along slowly. Um, let's see if I can, I don't, I don't have much done over last, since last time because life got in, has got in the way of knitting a little bit and I can only do about 10 rows or so at a time. And then I have to put it down and, and do something else for a bit. Um, but it, it's coming along um, and I'm enjoying it. It looks like you've got quite a few stitches. You're not knitting in the round, right? No, I'm, I'm not. I'm knitting flat, but my yarn, it turns out to be lace weight. And I, I am a, I'm very much a plus size lady. So I, I need all the, ex, you know, the, this is to go around my hips. It's amazing that you have done that much length. Yeah. Well, I probably have like- I'm, I'm used to knitting with lace weight and fingering mm -hmm. weight yarns. They're, they're my go-to yarns anyway. So it, it, you know, I'm not really bothered. I prefer finer weights also. In fact, this sweater that I'm wearing is fairly fine. Not lace weight, although I have used mm -hmm. lace weight, but yeah, because it's not super cold where I live. And also I like the drape of something that's- Yes, yes. This, okay, so that's, that's this has got a lovely drape. All right, we're gonna come back. Yep. Let me go to Haley. And you have to unmute yourself, please. Um, so I'm still knitting on the back and I don't have a lot of progress, I'm afraid. <laughs> it's just a piece of black with some white showing through and some ribbing at the bottom. Oops, I totally missed that. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, because I'm doodling around. I was responding to a comment in YouTube. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it doesn't look very much different to the last time um, we spoke. I'm working on the back. I've done some ribbing at the bottom and um, I'm doing the Armenian technique. It looks great. It looks Thank you. Great. Uh, Helen, I'm not sure if you want to talk at all. I'm still recovering from my injury and so I still haven't started. Right, I keep forgetting. So, so sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, that's okay. Thanks for being here. Uh, Julie. Yes, <clears throat> hello, I'm doing the Armenian knitting. So it's very slow. And um, like Eleanor said, I have to, I put, oh no, I think it was Haley. She said she has to put it down after a couple of hours because it hurts your fingers. But I've started the um, the bow on the front. I don't know whether you can see that bit of white there yes. in the black. So I have started that bit, but that's all I've done. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, Michelle. Get organized. Right, yeah, so my progress is, remember last time I'd finished the front. I've actually blocked the front now, but I, I need, that's the first block. <laughs> so that's another story. And I, I finished the back um, and I've sort of pressed it, but um, again, I'll talk about that later. So now I've started the sleeve, but I decided to do it bottom up rather than top down. So I've just started on the black, introducing the black on it. So that's where I'm at on the bottom, starting from the bottom of the sleeve. So okay, thank you. Amy. Hey, um, I I guess I'm being, I'm not doing it Armenian, I'm doing it Ar in Tarja. And I started with the sleeve because I wanted to practice that. So here, um, so I started um, with that. And um, I'm up to the cap now. So I think I'm going to switch over because I'm doing it flat. I'm going to switch over to the front and start. Um, because I think I got the intarsia down. <laughs> Very good. Um, Thank you. Ariana. Hi there. Okay, so I missed last week, but um, it seems that I, I'm just continually swatching. So I did start. Um, I did swatch a cowl that I'm going to show you guys. So this is what it looks like. And I just used some scrap yarn that I had left over. I wanted to try the technique. And um, what I found out was that it was too scratchy for me. I used a Latvian um, yarn combined with a Swedish yarn. So I had to put in a cashmere lining for around the neck. So I went back to square one and the sweater I'm wearing today is using the same yarn that you're using, Billy. So I said, oh, that one I can wear next to skin. So again, I swatched. And this is my baby swatch. And it's green and purple from Harrisville Design. So it's Rowan, uh, I forgot the name, Felted Tweed. And uh, I think it's Harrisville Shetland, those big cones. So I think that works. So I started and I did it in the round. And okay, I'm in the middle of a row here. Um, so that's what it looks like. And like, if I move my hands, you can sort of see what it looks like uh, where it's peeking through. I don't know. Oh, you don't even have to do that. It's very visible. And by the way, Renee Bryant commented from cyberspace that it's a pretty cowl. Oh, well, that's nice. It's super comfortable. I mean, I love it now that I have cashmere next to my neck. But I remember the first swatch I did. I'm a swatcher, I guess. And I like that sort of trellis looking pattern on the back. Right. So that is what I was trying to achieve here with the floats. So I don't know if you can see the trellisy look on the inside. So that's it. And, and this is because I went to the library and I got the book and I sort of tried to get into the uh, designer's head when she was talking about uh, impressionism and how the fabric felt when you, when she touched it, because she's not a knitter, she was a clothing designer. And so with that in mind, I remember, you know, the front was bigger than the back, which is a common design detail because you don't want to see seams. So Bill Blass, for example, he would introduce curves into his seam lines to give it a more um, feminine fit on his tailored jackets so I was looking at it 
in those terms, but I still converted it to doing it in the round. And I'm hoping that it's going to fit. We'll see. So that's why I didn't know that about Bill Blast. That's interesting. Yeah. Very gentle curves. So. Well, the person with the most curves that I've seen is Charles James. The, there are no straight side seams. Everything is like a three-dimensional sculpture thing. He's probably one of my favorite fashion designers, Charles James. Okay, let's go on to Joan. Got to unmute. Right. I um, am working on the sleeves, and I'm doing them two at a time. So it seems that I spend more of my time untangling the balls because I can't be bothered to put two on one side and two on the other. It, I just seem to hold them in my lap and let them fall and get all tangled. But um, it's working rather well. Here we are. It's not very impressive, but that's the top of one. And I figured out that if I'm not extremely careful the way I'm knitting, I'll work one, seat, work one sleeve, put it down. And instead of going to the other one, I just keep working on the first one. And so I'm getting confused that way. And so I, I know I wasn't going to get into everybody's issues yeah. on this round, but since you raised that, well, first of all, I wanted to say it looks like you're using the opposite colors of Ar Ariana. Right? You're doing like green and purple. Oh, yeah, I think so. Are you also using felted tweed, Rowan felted tweed? Uh, I'm using the JNS two ply jumper weight. Oh, oh, it's interesting that you both have chosen very unusual colors. Anyway, a tip, Joan, mm -hmm. that I sort of figured out myself because I've encountered that problem before. When I have two pieces that I'm knitting at the same time, I put a stitch marker together. I like clamp them together. Yeah. And yeah. I know that when I go this way that I have to continue going on to the other piece. So it's almost like they're linked together as one piece. You go over yeah. and you come yep. back. And as long as you yep. keep them hooked together, I think you can't go wrong. I mean, another tip is to go a little bit past that connection point. So it's really <laughs> clear that you're on the left sleeve now, mm -hmm. as opposed mm -hmm. to stopping in between where maybe you could go either way. So just yeah. go like a little bit into the next sleeve if you have to stop part way. Yep, thanks. Okay, Thea, we haven't heard from you. Okay, I have just unmuted. So um, last two weeks ago, I still didn't have my yarn and uh, my yarn didn't come. Uh, there were problems with the supplier, with the shipping and everything. So it didn't come. And in the meantime, uh, I got a lead on a sale here up in Canada. I'm here, I'm in Ottawa, by the way, beautiful snowy day. And uh, so I grabbed some, some soft Donegal tweed yarn. I'm feeling slightly embarrassed because, um, you know, Imitation is the most sincere form of flattery and uh, the yarns that were available as it happened were, I don't know if you can see this sort of darkish, bluish, blackish sort of thing. And a fuchsia, which is brighter than it appears on the screen. So it arrived and I swatched it. So this is the bow, the bow motif as a swatch. To my great surprise, this, uh, this yarn biases a little bit. So it has a slight lean. So I swatched it in a one by one rib and that is nice and straight. So 
that provides me with a solution for the for the lower part of the sweater. Now, as far as getting rid of the bias on the upper part of the sweater, I may hey, do let's it. Come, this... Let's come back. Let's come okay. back to okay. issues. That's fine. So that's fine. Great. that large piece that you showed us, that's your swatch. It looks like a whole sweater. That's a, well, that is a swatch. So I swatched at tension five and then at tension seven. And then I swatched the motif, just the bow motif. I don't know. So th that's just the bow without. Can you show us the back? Uh, it's Fair Isle without the floats being caught because I was just swatching. So I will be catching floats. When we talk about my, my bias issues, I'll, I'll come up with some other ideas that I like the way the, way the bow sort of pokes out a little bit with this approach. And it may be that the bias will is not really very, uh, maybe I, I'll be able to block it out. I'll, I'll still see, I want to swatch again, slightly differently, but anyway, we'll talk about this later. Let's okay, move thanks. on to somebody else. So Maria Elena, are you there? You're not on screen. Let's see who else hasn't spoken yet. Oh, there you are. Maria Elena, are you available? Do you want to come off mute and tell us where you're at? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, hi. This is the first time I'm actually talking. I've been voyeur. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've spent the past few months trying to just well, I'm still waiting for my yarn. I, I'm in New York City and I went to get the JNS yarn at my local yarn shop, which did not have enough JNS. So just to practice swatching, I ended up getting the black and this like super white white to practice. And I decided to make the traditional bow knot with the spendthrift yarn and employing the Armenian stitch. So I've been practicing. I've teaching myself to do it. I don't know intarsia and um, I tend to have a very loose gauge. So I first said, well, I should go down a needle size. So I did a big swatch and if you could see it and the bottom was really tight and stiff. That was three. So I graduated up to four and I was still not on gauge. The end, and I did the white so I can count stitches more easily. So the the size five gave me the right swatch. I don't know if you guys can see it. Definitely. So that's, I think I've got it. Like I did the Armenian style. I have Meg Swanson's book, which I was looking for it to show it to you. That was very helpful in that they provide a technique for the Armenian stitching. And I looked at your video with the two, one on each side, which I kept like mixing it up. It's, it's challenging either way, but I'm very persistent and I kept trying. Where you put both yarns on the index finger, the uh, main color to the farther out and the contrasting color closer in and you hold it on your left finger and then you put your needle under the first yarn and then over the second yarn and sort of twist it in and continue on and it catches the yarn as you knit. The challenge for me was keeping both yarns on that finger. Like you have to have the tension and hold it, but I got better with more, you know, I've been practicing. So I feel like I, I, um, I got it, you know, it does catch. Uh, I know someone mentioned before that you tend to drop the stitches but the good thing about this yarn is that they, they don't run. If you do, you can easily catch it. Uh, I also noticed that something Meg Swanson talks about when you're catching, if you trap at the same point on each row, you do get these lines, which I don't know if you can see them, but you can see them instead of dots like peppery, it, it starts to make more of the lines. So. I think you have to be aware and change from either trapping every other, every two stitches, every four stitches to avoid that. So 
Um, all of you have given me much inspiration. I'm not at the level of some of the knitters here, but I can say I'm persistent and dogged. So I'm waiting for my yarn, which Downtown Yarns on the Lower East Side said they ordered, but they've been taking too long. And I think I'm gonna make a trip to a, a yarn store in Brooklyn, Brooklyn General Store that has all of the she yarns. Has Jameson, yeah to get the yarn so that's where i'm at hopefully i do have one question and this was addressed in the earlier ones with the uh, sizing you know the small sizes I'm, I'm trying to do it exactly the way well of course i'm not i'm bigger than what they think so <laughs> i don't know i think the gussets that are provided the gusset um pattern may be what I need and I'm interested in in figuring that out because I think that's a, a neat thing to do most of the sweaters in general I always need a little more space at the bus so that's something but um, I notice a lot of people are doing intarsia which I'm interested in because you know I'm upset I've been I was so lucky to find you guys because I've been obsessed with Bonats this sweater for years and hoping to one day find a group that was doing it um, so I feel like I came across it. I don't even know how, and I signed up. So I'm very I'm so excited. excited that you found me. I know Why? because I said, that's, right. the, you know, and, and it's such a unique sweater. I love vintage sweaters, but I don't know certain techniques. Like everyone talks about intarsia, which I'm not, I don't really know what that is, but I'm obsessed with a vintage sweater that I saw on a Father Brown Mysteries episode. And I think it uses intarsia. I don't know if you can see it. One second. I'm bringing it closer. Can you, do you see it? So that's from a pattern, Weldon's pattern in London from the forties. I saw it. I saw it on Father Brown's Mysteries, one of the episodes, and I became obsessed and I went on the internet and I actually found the pattern and bought it. But um, that's like, gonna, you know, I think that's in Tarja. So I know some people here seem to be very adept at all these different techniques. And I would guess that that's stranded knitting as opposed to in Tarja. So okay. I haven't spoken yet. I'm doing intarsia, so this is probably a good place for oh, me okay. to jump in. But Michelle has her hand up, so is it something burning? No, it was just to say that I've got that pattern, that Egyptian <laughs> one, oh. but I, I've never attempted to knit it yet. So one day, but is it imagine... very hard? Is it a very hard thing to knit? Well, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't oh. I've got the pattern, but I've never knitted it. So I just wanted to say I've had it. Like the original pattern, not a copy or anything. I've got oh, wow. all the original. Yeah, so I kind of collect the old patterns. I, I prefer the originals than a copy, but sometimes you can't buy the original, so I might do with copies. But was well, a copy yeah. of the original? Well, I, I, I sometimes I have to buy a copy of an original, but I do prefer to buy the original because I think it it feels more pure. It's you know, and it's for me, it's more valuable. Oh, of coffee. course, of course. But I'm in New York, so I don't know if I would have come across a British original yarn. But um, so in answer to your question, is it hard? That's really relative. <laughs> it's got a lot of colors. And I'm sure if there isn't a chart, you're probably going to want to make a chart and follow along from that chart. So you're gonna be switching and you have to pay attention to every single little stitch. If it's like a figure and the face is, you know, five brown stitches with a black stitch for each eye. So it might be like- They did give me charts. In the oh, pattern. there are charts. Okay, so yes, I mean, you have to pay very careful attention. You can't jump on the subway and try and <laughs> I don't do anything. So when you said that it's color strand work, that'd be like, because I have knitted Fair Isle. I, I did. I would say it would be much more like Fair Isle than Intarsia. Okay. So I'm going to give a little explanation of what Intarsia looks like, because I'm knitting Intarsia and I haven't gotten very far, but um, 
So intarsia would be like color blocking. So this whole section of pink, I'm not running any black yarn behind it. Oh, let me go on speaker view. I think you'll see me better. Now this area, I had to do stranded. And maybe if I flip it around, you can understand why I opted to do that. I didn't have to. Here's the deal. All of this is black. So I have one ball of black that I'm running down here. But when I get over to here, I don't want to carry the black strands behind this pink section because I would have to catch it. Or if I didn't catch it, I would have a very big float that I would get my fingers or rings caught on. So I attached a separate ball of pink and then another ball of black for this. And because these other two blacks are very close to this, I was using one ball for this section and only one pink. That's why I have stranding here for me to get from this pink through those other little center sections and then over to here. I stranded it because if I didn't, I would have needed a ball of pink here, a ball of pink here, ball of pink here, and another ball of pink there. You want to talk about managing tangles, that would be just a total nightmare. So this part is intarsia, but this center part is actually stranded and not intarsia. When you hear the word intarsia, just think color block, a big section that's one color butting up against another section that's another color. So hopefully that explains that. Now, I would have been a lot further along had I not been trying to do shaped intarsia for my bow. So last time we met, I explained why I didn't have steps, little jig jags. I did something called shaped intarsia and you can refer to my short video that demonstrates how to do that. Um, you're essentially combining some black stitches on one side and adding pink stitches on the other side when you're going in this direction. And it gives you a very smooth edge. I don't know if you can see it. They come together really smoothly. So I was trying to do that down here because I didn't want all this jagged stuff. I ripped this out no fewer than six or seven times. The shape wasn't right. I didn't have the right number of stitches. Um, I just wasn't happy with it. And what I had done was I knit the whole center section pink and I went back and I duplicate stitched over the black areas because I thought, oh, that's gonna be easier than interchanging all the colors like I'm doing now. Well, what ended up happening was this black section was very stiff compared to the drapiness and flexibility of the areas beside it. So I picked out all of those duplicate stitches. I got so frustrated, I used a scissor and I started snipping it. I mean, it was a mess. It took me probably an hour, an hour and a half to just unpick all of that. And then I ripped back. I was like down to here. I ripped back to where my V-neck begins. So a good, I would say eight or 10 inches. And I thought it'll be worth it. So for people who are watching, here's my advice that I really have uh, due to my husband commenting once upon a time when he saw me struggling with something that really wasn't looking good. He said, just rip it back. You'll be happy that you did. So these days, if I'm knitting on something and I'm not real happy with it, I take it back to a point where it's good. And if it means ripping the whole thing out there, this sweater that I'm wearing, I knit the entire sweater and didn't like it. It's, it's a very unusual pattern um, because it has a lot of short rows to create this pucker stuff. I could have fit a grapefruit inside. And I thought I was following the instructions. So I ripped the whole sweater out. 
But, you know, in the end, I finally got something that I wasn't embarrassed to wear. So it's worth it. If you're ever unsure, rip it out, rip it out. <laughs> if I was going to teach people to knit, I think I would require that they rip something out. You made a swatch, great, rip it out. Don't get married to it if it's not going to make you happy. That, that's my unsolicited advice. Okay, so other issues. Let's go back through. Um, why don't you just raise your hand and, and, you know, that way I don't have to call on you. So if you have an issue or something that you want to share or get feedback, go ahead, Michelle. Well, actually, I, I, I'm beginning to think mine's not going to fit me. <laughs> Because um, even though I did, I, I totally washed the front. Well, I didn't wash it, but I just wet it totally and tried to stretch it. But it doesn't stretch width. <laughs> it stretches lengthwise, but not width. So I keep going, uh -uh, not that, but I don't want to rip it. Um, but I, because the back's shorter, Oh, you know, not as wide as the front. I'm beginning to wish I did the back the same width as the front, but I didn't. It's too late now. I've done the whole front, uh, the whole back, but I don't think it's going to fit me. So, has anyone got any tips that uh, you can super block stuff? <laughs> but well, you, you could know, get a little panel up the side. Like well, I was, I was thinking that. Could I do two panels? Why not? I mean, if I do it quite neat, no one's going to see the panels, are they? When so, I do mattress stitch, you can't really see my seam. No. So Especially that, is, when that is, well, exactly. So I might have to do that. So I was thinking that I could do some strips to go. But obviously, I've got it makes the armhole bigger. So yes. as I'm only starting the sleeve then I've still got the time to, you know, so, yeah, it's when I do that. Do I do that before I finish the sleeves? Maybe Lisa, I do. Lisa also said that with this pattern, like, she had to block and block and block. Right. She did. And I was thinking, has anyone got blocking boards? Yes. I've been looking at blocking boards. Yeah. And I've, there's a few people on YouTube that have show you how to block with blocking boards, but... Even wet, this project, it just doesn't stretch. Probably if I'd have used the Jameson two-ply, I might have been successful. But the, the yarn I'm using, it just hasn't got that stretch width-wise, only length. And I'll end up <laughs> easy to make it long, but not width-wise. So, so I am contemplating, you know, but I don't really want to buy the blocking boards if... I'm not really going to be successful in making this wider. And I don't want to rip it. I don't want to give it too much pressure because this, this comb, my, my husband was joking about the other night and, and I pulled it and it snapped easily, <laughs> this yarn. And I thought, oh, God, so I can't give it too much pressure because I could end up ripping if so I try to. <laughs> Dawn, who is out there in our YouTube audience, who's been on an, another knit along with me suggested, yes, Michelle, you should knit the panels up the side yeah. to make it bigger. Yeah, I think I will. Before doing the sleeves. Yeah. She, she also yeah. wants to know the name of the Egyptian pattern. I have it. Um, I have it. It's called Egyptian Pattern Jumper. And... Um, I mean, I could, it's on Etsy. If you go to the, if you go to Etsy, that's how I found it. Etsy. I mean, this is the title that I have here, and there's a. Can you see that? Oh, it's backwards, right? It doesn't. No. No, there are good. copies on eBay. People are selling copies on eBay as well of that pattern. I'm sure they are. I think everyone saw that Father Brown mystery episode where yes, Dawn said she loves Father Brown mystery, <laughs> and this the, the character wears that sweater through the whole episode, and it's it's, I, I mean, it, the the pattern continues in the back as well. Although some people choose not to knit it in the back, it it looks it's so cute, even though it is a little busy. 
I'm thinking, where would I wear something like that in New York? But I love it. So anywhere. <laughs> Anyway, I'm so surprised and really delighted that there are so many New Yorkers. I mean, we're not that large a group. And there's we're not. you, there's Lisa, there's Amy, and there's me. Wow, we should have a little branch. But on the note about the um, panels, other, since I haven't yet begun, and I also can tell I will need more inches, um, if you add knit inches, will that change the pattern? If I add more stitches in the, you know, to the pattern, like to the front and back panels, would that change the design or something? I think it would be more shaped. It would shape it, wouldn't it? At the moment, I think it's quite straight down. But if right. you sort of, then you're going to have that shape, aren't you, as you go up, which is fine. We still look good. I mean, I'm 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 probably going to have to make some panels in addition or the gusset. I mean, the gusset seems with a Jameson on my swatch, it does it does stretch, but you know that's another thing about knitting this Armenian style. You have to stay loose because if you if you don't watch it, it'll suck in the stitches just like fair isle has that which i i i'm pretty good at that because i'm a very very loose knitter in fact i tend to be too loose i don't know i mean but it's working out okay but i will i'm curious to see how other people deal with that issue the panel sounds like a good solution to me i think it might look cool having a panel on the side you know it might make it a little you know give it an extra dimension just know that your arm side is going to have a different shape than the sleeve cap. So if you change that, you're going to oh. have to really rethink the upper part of the sleeve or it's not gonna fit in properly. If you do the panels. If you're changing what's going around here, Mm -hmm. what's fitting into it, that sleeve has uh -huh. to have the right number of stitches around. So if you made this opening larger, you're gonna have to uh, adapt the upper part of your sleeve. Not that you can't do it, but it's gonna be trial and error. Be prepared. Could try to lose weight, but that's <laughs> Start. Yeah, that's, that's what I said about my wedding band. The jeweler keeps offering to resize it because it really it doesn't fit on my left hand anymore. And I said to him, "No, I have to resize myself. Who want you cutting some of the gold out of my ring and keeping it?" So, with the gusset, with the pattern um, instructions for the gusset, does that also? include a pattern on how to fit it in? I, I, I can look at the pattern, but I'm just asking. I, guess. I haven't knit the gusset and I didn't really look at that part of the pattern, but I think she does give oh. some idea of, I think it's like a diamond shape. Yeah. So yeah, I think there's some information in there. So let's see, what is Dawn saying? If you do panels, it's probably better to knit the sleeves downwards. Yes, I was going to say that by picking up the stitches around the arm side and knitting from there. Well, that's an interesting point. Instead of making the sleeve the way the pattern calls for it, just put your front and back together and have that sleeve opening and then just pick up the stitches um, around it and knit your sleeve down. You could do that. I'm probably not gonna do it that way, but one could. I'm just always afraid. I've had such a bad experience with too much fabric in here. I mean, I really wanted to show an old sweater of mine, which is when my husband first started to tell me like, rip it out, you won't be happy. I've mentioned the sweater before. It was from Vogue Knitting Magazine, a, a vintage issue. I knit the sleeves and they were just so voluminous, I could have put another arm inside of them. And it was just too much fabric. It didn't, it didn't look nice. And I kept re-knitting the sleeve, re-knitting it and taking stitches out until I finally got it to be 
the contour that I wanted. So sometimes there's a lot of redoing, but if you want something that fits well, be prepared, be prepared to do that. Okay, Haley. Um, I was just going to say to Maria Elena, um, you know, if you're if you're not, if the pattern isn't the right size for you, I'd be tempted to cast on the right number of stitches to make it the right size. That's sort of what I've done with mine. Um, so I calculated my gauge and how wide I wanted it to be. And from that worked out how many stitches I needed. Obviously, there is more work to do when you get further up. Um, like Billy was talking about armholes. Um, but I felt that something like that would be a bit cleaner than adding in gussets because that's going to create complications for you as well. So I it really that, depends whether, you know, that um, the measurement around the bottom, I, I think it was 37 or 38 inches, wasn't it? I think it's that all the way up. For me, that wasn't right, particularly as my gauge was off. So if you need a different size to that, or your gauge is different, you can just recalculate the number of stitches. Right. That's what I thought. I just, I need more, I need more stitches overall. Yeah. I just need more width, especially yeah. as I get up here. Um, I could certainly increase him at the bottom. It won't make a difference, but I, I, I wonder if the design, like I'll have more of the white up here, I, I think it's, it's mostly in the, in the center. So um, I'm, I think you'd have to have a look a little bit at the shoulders if you're going to have a different number of stitches there. But because it's mostly in the center, if you just think of your extra stitches as being on the side and being in right. the main color, I don't think that would be too much of a com complication. I think there's just a, a small amount of maths when it comes to um, casting off around here. But I, I feel like I haven't done it before, but I feel like it's not too complicated. So um, <laughs> if you wanted to talk about that when we get to that point, we can do. Um, I think the main thing is to know your measurements. Yeah. I'm narrow from here to here so and bigger in the bust. So I might be able to wear like a small or an extra small for the shoulders, but I better start increasing as I move down towards the bust, which by the way, I hadn't mentioned this. I have done part of the back and part of the front and from the top down and I tried it on and I could see that the back is halfway down my back, whereas the front is only like hitting the top of my bust. So my solution for that, which I hope will work out okay, is I'm doing short rows across just from like a little below the underarm where my bust is at its widest, I'm adding additional length in there, but not additional stitches. So the width is gonna stay the same, but I'm going back and forth, back and forth extra time. So it'll give me a little more in this zone. We'll see how that works out. Eleanor. Yeah, I was going to say, I am so large that I've had to completely regrade the pattern. Um, I've And what I did was I actually found um, a pattern just for a plain V-neck jumper that would fit me um, and used the schematic from that to work out, you know, how big do I need the hips? How big do I need the bust, etc. And then calculated the number of stitches I need to, to cast on um, for my gauge and and then to amend the actual shape of the pattern so it fits so instead of having you, your shoulder seams here and, and your arm seams there they're sort of worked backwards I fact, literally I took some of the stitches that I would have needed on the back and sort of migrated them to the front so my front will will work out larger than my back but I've also because my hips are significantly bit bigger than my bust I've put in a very subtle a-line 
um, decreasing up up to my bust and then sort of for the area that's going to be across my bust like you I'm doing short rows um, and it just so happened that when I was working it out with my gauge and what have you when it came to plotting the um, the bow on the front of it 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 turned out that for ev every stitch on the original pattern that Lisa did I you know her one stitch wide one stitch high is my two stitches wide two stitches high and it just means that the bow is actually going to be proportionally bigger on me it's, it's going to sort of start probably at about my waist my natural waist level rather than sort of slightly higher up oh. you, you can always shorten the those strands of the bow I mean, I haven't done a lot of things from the top down, but I'm, I'm starting to yeah. do it more um, because like Eleanor, my hips are quite a bit bigger than yeah. the rest of me. And I want to do that at the very end when I can try the whole thing on and see where it's hitting me. Because yeah. if it's too short or too long, it doesn't look good. It's got to be right at the sweet spot. And I, it's harder for me to judge if I'm going from the bottom up. Of course, you can do a provisional cast on and then you can knit down to whatever length you want. But my experience has been that I can see that line going across where the provisional cast on was pulled out. So this particular time I'm starting at the top and hoping as you know that I can work downwards and keep trying it on. Okay, Helen. Oops. Um, just a comment about the, the bow. I think the bow, no matter what you're with, is gonna look beautiful. I'd be more concerned about the sailor portion on the back because they have to line up and you probably want the sailor portion on your back to sit uh, at, what is a pleasing proportion to the rest of you? Hmm. I, I totally agree. And I made sure that that's another reason why I worked top down. So I, once I got my front pink, I went to the back and I made sure that my, I don't have my back handy or I would show it to you, but I made sure that the back pink lines up with this when I basted them together. So, so when you say you work the top down, you just follow, you just began the pattern at the top. I've never done that, but I mean, I could, might as well try. You just start, instead of when you start at the very bottom, you went to the top and work down. Right. I just did it in reverse. If she said like bind off 15 stitches, I cast on 15. If she said um, decrease 12, I added 12. And I got it in reverse and then I worked down. Oh, so you do have to be mindful that you're yes. doing the opposite. Yes, but you know what? The first time you do it, you could just draw yourself a little diagram. It's pretty intuitive when you're doing it you'll see like, oh, if I decrease, like the instructions say, <laughs> I'm gonna you know, knit myself right out of business. I am gonna have to increase to get the, the kind that, of that it size. Is. Yeah, so it's not hard. It I'm also gives you, <laughs> sorry, it also gives you that softer edge on the bottom when you finally cast off. Oh, yeah, that's true. Well, that's another thing for me that I like to do at the very end. I could do it at the beginning too, but I find that I don't, depending on the sweater, I don't always like a ribbed hem because I don't necessarily want it clinging. And I think it makes it sporty. And I think this sweater is kind of like a dressier sweater, almost like something you could wear evening cocktail party. So I'm pretty sure that I'm gonna knit down and then do a hem that folds under. 
I think the pat I don't think there's any ribbing on the bottom of the pattern. I think there's some sort of crochet edging. Right. You're right. Certainly I've I've you know, because I've started from the bottom bottom up. Um, I just did a long tail cast on and then started knitting. Um, I didn't do any ribbing. Right, there's no ribbing. Right, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to mislead. Yes. I don't always like that thin lower edge. I don't know how the crochet edging, um, I don't know if that would prevent it from curling up totally but I don't like that just like hanging and dropping off and, and being like that same thickness. I feel that a hem, and I've been doing this more and more in my sweaters, that that turned under hem gives it a very finished, substantial edge and it hangs, it hangs nicely. Joan. Yeah. Um, I think what we have to remember about this pattern is when it was designed, most of Europe had just come through the First World War. So those women were thick, thin and malnourished. And I don't know if you can tell, but I am not thick, thin and malnourished. So virtually, virtually every vintage pattern that we're going to come across we're going to have to make major changes just because we are not 19 year old socialites who haven't eaten a square meal for, <laughs> for a decade. Yeah, I think we. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome to the contemporary knitter trying to knit vintage. These are the issues in just about every single vintage pattern that you're going to come across. It's usually written in one size and it's almost never my size or your size, yeah. whoever you are. Now, I Sophie did, who's I, not here, she says she is that size. And I have another woman who has been a guest on my show, Kati. She also mm -hmm. is that size. I don't think she has to adjust patterns at all. I so. know that I, I have a, I'm also a machine knitter and I have some vintage machine patterns and uh, there is never so much joy as when I find a pattern for an extra large mature woman mm -hmm. and, and they're always two inches smaller than I am. So, so I'm, I'm getting very much better at my pattern math. Because it's, it's just a skill I'm picking up. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the number one issue, I would have to say. Ariana. Okay, so I wanted to show you, when I did my cowl swatch, I did the technique, the crochet technique. And I'm really impressed with how flat it does lay. So on the bottom here, you can see this is crocheted. And in the pattern, it says crochet with two sizes smaller than your knitting needle. It's beautiful. I really, really like it. I did it on the top too, but then I added, a, uh, you know, the, uh, what is this called? A hoodie style uh, tie on the side. So it was easy to pick up from the crochet edge. So I, I hope that helps. I think I'm gonna use this again. And for the sizing, it's just a comment I wanna make because I mean, the benefit of all of my swatching, I'd like to share it. So this swatch, I increased the size of my needles to a size 4.5. And then I, I really stretched it. I, I actually blocked it over some sort of a candle or whatever it was, really stretching it out. And it gave me uh, I think it was five stitches to the inch or four, four stitches to the inch. And then I used one of my sweaters that actually fit and I tried to get the right cast on number. So I'm going with that. And now that I'm knitting this sweater, I'm looking at it and it looks so much smaller 
even though I'm using all the same needles. So I start it with the bigger needle on the bottom for a bigger, beefier uh, hip. And then I went down in needle size to help it sort of go like that. And my third comment is on gussets. All the sweaters that I'm knitting, like including this one I'm wearing, I always add a gusset under the arm. I just find it much more comfortable. Um, it looks kind of weird when you put it on, but it feels better and I find that it drapes better. So those are my little two cents worth. It's going to be very interesting when we're all at that place where we're trying to assemble this section to see who uses the gusset, who likes it, who doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm going to need it yet, but it's on the table. Exactly. I know, I know growing up, my mother sewed and revised a lot. You know, you didn't, I didn't have many clothes growing up, but she constantly revised or sewed up clothes for me. And she, she used to call them in Spanish, the amante diamonds. And she always, you know, as I started reaching puberty, whatever, she would start adding diamonds, which are, I learned now are called gussets, but they, they're pretty amazing that they do give you room and you don't notice it unless you're raising your arm a lot. But I used to wear blouses with that. And no one ever noticed it. So, but with the change of the needle size, the pattern says a size five and, um, Somebody, you, the person who just spoke, and I don't see the, oh, oh, it's in dark, so I can't see your name. Uh, it's Ariana. Ariana, you started with, you ended up with a size four needle? Because I I got gauge with size five. No, I think it, she's four millimeter. I don't think she's talking US four. Oh, okay. So it might be, because okay. it's. Yeah, I, I up my needle size, and I'm willing to live with a bigger bow, because everything gets bigger. So I have an Excel spreadsheet uh, with a new bow that I created and I'm starting at a different spot in the sweater. So this is, uh, you know, just make it up as you go along. But like I said, my cowl was basically using the correct needle size uh -huh. uh, that's in the, in the pattern. This is following exactly the pattern, the sizing oh. and everything. Right. But um and the big bow, do you have a picture of the bigger, the larger bow? Well, the one I redesigned in Excel, I have it on a piece of paper here, but I also have it in my Excel spreadsheet. I don't know if it shows up there. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, and because, because each bow that I saw, like I said, I went to the library and I looked at her, her artistry. All the bows were different. So I just modified the bow to my liking. And when you knit it, we knit, we forget to knit a stitch here and there. So I'm willing to live with that too. And I'll duplicate stitch if I want to at the end to modify. So I have to, I'd like to learn how to do that stuff with the, I mean, I, I think a bigger bow might look nicer if I'm, you know, a bigger person, you know, but. But maybe way. not. By the way, when I did the duplicate stitching, my first go round that I said I had ripped out, because it was so bulky, I tried it. I mean, I should have been doing this when I was swatching, but what I did after I saw that it was so stiff was I took my yarn and I split it. There are two strands that are like wound together. I separated out the strands and I used a single part of you know the double strand to do the duplicate stitching and that seemed to be a lot better it covered adequately the stitch behind it without that extra bulk so when i'm talking about duplicate stitch i'm talking about like for example on my little bow here on the bottom i don't know how much it shows but as per my design i had left out a couple of purple ones here so it would be a purple one here and there. So it would be just one stitch that I would cover up if, you know. If you have to. Yeah, if it, yeah. If it bothers me. But if not, I'll just leave it. And who knows, this may become a pillow and I'm willing to live with that because it may not even fit. We'll see. So Renee Bryant in our YouTube audience is asking, can't software help in adjusting patterns? 
And I'm asking, does anybody know if there's such a software that does that? Yeah, I can comment on that because I'm, I'm actually taking a, a course in grading and um, I'm actually using this pattern <laughs> as my um, homework assignment. But, um, you know, I won't think I'll have it graded out in time to give it out to people. Maybe if you do this um, knit along again. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, it software helps you but you still have the issues of the arms and stuff like that, that you still have to tweak with, tweak with. So grading is not, it's still, an, it's somewhat of an art and a science. You can't just dump it in a, in a spreadsheet or a software and you magically, it comes out with all the sizes. Unfortunately, no, that would be great if it did, but um, yeah, I no, think, you still have a lot of tweaking still to do. I think the crux of the issue is every single one of us has different touch points. Yeah. You know, I have narrow shoulders, but somebody else with the same bust as me, mm -hmm. same waist and same hips may have a broader shoulder. Hello, that changes everything. Right. Yeah, because okay. that's what, yeah, because I really had to completely redo mine because like you, I have very, very narrow shoulders and I have a huge bust. <laughs> so like if I did patterns based on the bust, you know, the shoulders would be out to here. So it's, you know, it, it basically had to rework the whole pattern because the sleeves, the the whole because if it doesn't fit on the upper part of the body forget it so and don't forget someone like Eleanor she might be wider but she she's not the equivalent extra height so right. you can't just say oh I'm going to double the width and double the height I'm just going to double everything everything no. yeah no she'd have to be like 10 feet tall right so, so yeah no no very so unique to each Person. That's why I say, I think the best thing to do is to know your measurements, to know where you want your shoulder seam to be. And for some people that might be 14 inches, for other people it might be 16 inches. And then if you're knitting at the shoulders and you need 16 inches, but you only have 12, no, you better rip back and start yeah. increasing as you approach the shoulder. Because it's, it's never going to be right. From all that I've heard more experts than me say, this is the part of the sweater mm -hmm. that's the most important, important because yeah. it's around your face. It's the part when people are looking at you, this is the part that they see. So I think it's really important to get this area fitting well, much more than what's going on at your waist. Yeah, because it's your skeleton that really dictates how it sits. How it not, yeah, not yeah. the padding. <laughs> oh, Renee is saying um, she thought that I mentioned a program in previous video. Uh, yeah. An app. You had mentioned a, an app, Stitch. Stitch something. Fiddle, but it doesn't calculate anything. It's just a way for me to put my stitches onto a grid and tinker with it. So I'm able to look at it like, you know, I, I mapped out my bow on their grid. And then I thought, well, I don't like the length of that strand. I want to make it a little bit shorter. I want to make it a little bit wider. I could tinker with it. Same thing with the shape of my collar. Um, I don't have the same number of stitches in my pink that Lisa calls for in her pattern for her white collar. I made this section fewer number of stitches because my shoulders are, are narrower. I didn't want to take it from the black, so I took it from the pink. But I could chart that and have a look at it to make sure that it's got the proportions that look right to me. It's really touch and go. And whoever said, you know, it's an art more than it is a science. I, I think you have to factor that in. How is it going to look? 
I think Eleanor has got it. Like, who cares how many stitches there are? She needs that width because that's how she wants it to fit her. Yeah, because all, yeah, all the bows are different. Even the sleeves, that white portion on the sleeves, some of the photos you see of the, of the actual garments, some of them, it looks like it's only a couple of inches. I seen one where it looks like it's like almost halfway, halfway up, up the sleeve. Yeah. Right. So it seems like every sweater was individual. Right. Yes. These were not machine made. They were handmade and most likely by different knitters. So each time I re-knit mine, I knit it slightly differently. I have knit this thing at least six times already. And each time it's been a little bit different. This time I, I think I'm pretty happy. Okay, Michelle. Yeah, what I was going to say is, so I think mine came up too small. It's because I really didn't want, with my yarn I chose, it was so fine, I just felt it wouldn't look right in on bigger needles. And I think that's why I stuck to the, what is it? Is it 3.25 needles that the pattern said? So I think that's that was why I stuck at it. And also Lisa said block, block, block. So I was thinking as it was coming out too like quite small, that I would be able to block, block, block and make it wider. But obviously I, it depends on the type of yarn you're using. So that's why I blocked, you know, I totally wet the front. Uh, it might have stretched a bit, but I don't think even by blocking, blocking and blocking, it is really going to make a difference because of the type of yarn I've got. Mm. So, but yeah, I'm definitely going to do those gussets. So I'll hopefully, before we come back next time, I'll have those finished and because they're straight then hopefully it won't take too long. So that's my mission for the next show <laughs> to get them done. Okay. Joan. Right. I have a bit of a cautionary tale, uh, issues I came up with. I had my sweater at my knitting group, and everyone loves it, and they think it's all beautiful, and they all said nice things. And I was so pleased with myself that uh, I forgot to put the lid on my travel mug properly. Oh, no. And when I... And when I got home in the three minute drive from the community club to my house, it was absolutely soaked in tea. Now, I'm using an ultraviolet purple on a really dark green. And it's still got all the machine oil in it. So all I did was I, was I swished it through the warm water and until it stopped turning brown. And I semi-blocked it, laid it out to dry. And um, I found out that after, I, I blocked my swatches anyway, but even after a good soaking of tea and the blocking, it turned out exactly the way I wanted it. And I, I was a little bit iffy with it before, but it was a happy accident. Oh, thank goodness. Which, which is why I'm <laughs> knitting on story. tea. Oh, it was just I, heart pounding. Uh, and that's why I've started my sleeves, because I had to do something while waiting for it to dry. Um, I got past the cap of the sleeve, and I'm doing them two back and forth, flat on one needle. And then I thought, well, why don't I just magic loop it and do the sleeves in the round. I can do that. I'm an experienced stranded knitter. As soon as I did that, I did three rounds and the fabric, fabric changed totally. It, it just got tighter and had less give. And it was, I think, 1130 at night and I was getting frustrated. And I put it down. And the next morning I came back and thought, no, you don't have to put up with this shit. <laughs> I just ripped it out. That's it. That's what I'm talking about. Yep. I know I, if you're a new knitter out there watching this, you're thinking, what are they, crazy? 
They spent mm-hmm. hours doing that. Yes, yes, <laughs> hours. But yeah. for a lifetime of beautiful sweater wearing, take those hours and throw them away. You will not regret it. I can't emphasize that enough because it's the most bitter pill to swallow, especially if you're just starting to knit. Every stitch is so precious, but take it from those of us who have the experience. You don't want to well, wear something where people say to you, oh, did you make that? <laughs> or, no, I want or even, people asking me, where did you buy that sweater? <laughs> yeah, or, or even worse, did your grandma make that? Oh, please. <laughs> My grandmothers are both dead a long time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a similar experience when I, I did a Fair Isle sweater, a Noric on pattern, which I fell in love. It was on the cover of Vogue where it was Fair Isle um, called the Persian yoke sweater. And I didn't realize there was an important instruction that I kept missing that when you change colors, she advised that you start carrying the yarn, which we're doing in the Armenian before you get to that color. I, did, I missed that instruction. So when I would change colors, I kept getting these huge holes. And I thought, well, I'll fix it later. And when I realized what I needed to do, I was well down the path. And this was intricate pattern. I ripped it all out um, and just chalked it up to experience. And, and I, I ultimately came out with a very nice sweater, which I get lots of compliments on. And it did employ some of the techniques of the Armenian because she advises that before you get that to your color, you start carrying. I didn't know what it meant, but I figured it out. So Helen put a little comment in the chat, which I think is worth mentioning. No point in saving a bit of time to waste the time completing the project and not wear it. Well said. Okay, Thea, you have your hand up. There we go. All right. So I'm wondering if the others here, those of you that are listening, um, if you have come across yarn that biases, because what I didn't realize when I bought this yarn is that it's single ply and it has, it has biased. And I'm trying to figure out how I will solve this because I do want to use this yarn. It, I think it suits the project quite nicely. Um, one of my ideas is to do uh, two rows knit, two rows purl, so that bias in one direction on the, t- the two rows of knit will be offset by bias in the other direction on the two rows of purl. Um, of course, that'll mean that I'll have to do intarsia rather than fair isle, but that's all right. I'll, uh, I'll check it out and I'll have to check out how that's going to look in terms of the, the way the edges look on the, on the color change, which I haven't done before. So, but if, if any of you have ideas on you know, what else I might do to tackle it, I'd love to hear it. I have worked with, with that Donegal tweed in fuchsia actually, and I never, I was doing it in stockinette and it continued to bias and it I never could get it to unbias. But I but I think that in a garter stitch or or a variation of a garter stitch, it should zig the zags and zag the zigs. It'll be a, a different looking sweater, but it'll still be pretty nice. And why not? Why not indeed? It might be nicer. It would have a nice twist to it. You know, a fall garter stitch or garter, you know, pearl knit, two pearl, two knit. I can't think of any other solution, um, you know, that will end up with uh, something that is for the most part straight, which is what, what, what I want. Uh, I otherwise. Wonder- I wonder if you could do the bow in 
pearl if you've done the rest of it in knit. Because I think the thing that stops it from biasing is to have a combination of knits and pearls, I think. So and I'm wondering if you did like, you know, knitting all the way across to get to the bow, switch to pearl. So your bow will be in reverse stockinette. Okay. I mean, if you don't mind how that looks or the other way around. I think another thing is on the side seams, if you did like, you know, one or two stitches in from your selvage in pearl when you're on the knit side. Well, my, my one by one rib is perfect. And I'm, yeah, actually, I'm actually thinking of using that as, you know, from, from below the bow, like let's say four rows, up to about four rows below the bow. And that will kind of give a more of a body conscious look like the way Elsa intended her sweater to be. And so it'll be, you know, close, closer fitting at the bottom and then sort of more loose like a sweater is supposed to be, you know, with room for whatever are undergarments you have um, in the bust, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of, you know, it'll be a combination of, of approaches probably. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do about the sleeve, uh, but I'll get to that eventually. <laughs> have you tried um, Eastern style knitting. So in, instead, when we knit and pearl, we wrap our yarn round the needle anti-clockwise. Now, if Eastern style, they wrap round clockwise. Will that help to offset some of the bias? Well, that is a wonderful suggestion. And if I was a hand knitter, I would try it. But I'm a machine <laughs> knitter. <laughs> So I'm doing this on a standard four and a half millimeter pitch uh, brother machine uh, with a river. And uh, that's why for me, changing from knit to pearl will change the direction because to change what you do is you, you take off your knitting and you rotate it 180 degrees and you rehang it on the needles. So when if it biases always towards the right or towards the left on the machine by rotating the, the the knitting you're counteracting that you're changing the direction of the bias so i'm thinking that may be my only solution for this particular project now if i was doing something um on a bulky machine i would i would run the Donegal with a plied yarn together uh, to decrease bias. But in this case, I'm just not willing to do that because it's already thick enough. Well, I Ellen think you may be a wee bit pooched with that. <laughs> yeah. Helen gave a link in the chat to an article about um, how to try and stop the bias. So I put that link temporarily in the chat, but eventually I will put it in the comments or maybe Helen can go back and put That'd it in be great. a real comment section. Michelle. Billy, I saw I just chatted what I was going to say hmm. and it was because Mine stretches length, um, lengthways, but not widthways. I wonder whether I would have had a better result if I'd have knitted it side to side rather than, you know, like normal. Do you, do you see what I mean? Because some patterns in the 50s were knitting from side to side. And because mine only stretches width, uh, lengthways and not width, that would have given me more stretch. And, I, you know, as long as I knitted it to the length I wanted, well, that course. would have solved my problem. I mean, of course you could do that, but it's totally going to change the look because all of your lines yes. are vertical with yeah. the horizontal and you'd have to completely redo the bow. You'd have to like re-graph um, because your stitch width is probably different than your stitch height. So, you know, you would have some, also some maneuvers 
Yeah, it'd be interesting if, if there was anyone out there that has actually done that, though. You know, it'd be interesting because people do try different things, don't they? So it'd be they interesting. Do. Might be easier to just rip out and start over, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sometimes that is the best solution. And instead of, you know, trying to throw, like, good time after bad, Okay, I think that we've been on a really long time and I think we made a lot of headway today, a lot of good pointers and tips. Um, one more thing that I'll say before we end for today is somebody asked me before we started recording if I was going to divulge anything about future knit-alongs. And yes, I have given this a little bit more thought. I think that my future, my next knit-along, I'm not sure that this will be every knit along, but I think my next knit along, I really would like to have beginning knitters, people who have never knit a sweater, not beginning, beginning, but people who have knit scarves and hats and they don't realize that they actually can knit a garment. I want those people and I want to do something simple with them. I also would like to find perhaps a yarn company that would kind of buy into this concept. So if anybody's watching and knows, um, because I think they could help promote it to newbie knitters and maybe some more yarn. I mean, that, that's the direction I'm thinking that we would all buy our yarn from the same place and all be knitting with you know the same variables. So it's a thought, but unless I really am getting feedback that people are interested, I'm, I'm not going to go there until I have a bigger audience for it. Because just to do it for two people is not as much fun as doing it for 20 or 30 people. Um, let's see, Helen, she's the researcher here. Meg Swanson. Oops. I lost the chat one second. Meg Swanson in Vogue Winter 97-98 has an article on two-color knitting. She also talks a bit about her frustrations on learning the technique. Yeah, there's lots of different techniques for using more than one color. We've mentioned a few today, stranded knitting, Fair Isle, Intarsia. Um, I don't know what else there might be, but those are the big ones. Armenian, oops, how could I forget? All right, Michelle, do you have something else you want to say before we bid one another adieu? You're muted. I see you're talking, but maybe you're not talking to us. Okay, anybody else have any parting comments, questions? No? Two weeks. Same time, same place. Thanks for being here, all of you. And thanks to everybody watching. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.